Okay, so um, yeah, like you heard, my name is John Agnes, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how you can create small core dumps on systems, uh, particularly for embedded systems. Let me just take a moment to explain what a core dump is, because there may be people that actually don't know. Uh, Linux has a, a feature in it that when an application crashes, for example, uh, then it's possible that the complete memory image of that process is stored onto disk. Uh, these are core dump files. And this is uh, so that the kernel will pack some ELF header information onto this uh, file. So what you have is a nice ELF file. ELF is uh, so, uh, executable packaging format, so you can actually uh, you index into this file and know where, it's, uh, where are the different symbols, etc. So core files are actually extremely useful. You know, if you have uh, products that are out there, and you know you have applications that are crashing on these things, and so they're you know sent back to the company because it doesn't work. It would be nice if the company could then look at what what happened, why did it crash, and if you have a core dump, uh, then you can use a debugger and you can see the whole you know what was the stack trace, you know what did the heap look like, you can, you can actually see what happened, what caused this to crash. Maybe there was memory corruption because of uh, EM interfer interference in the hardware or whatever. So you would think that all these products that are come, that are out there that are all running on, on Linux these days, they would all have core dump support in them, so that if they get sent back to the company, then the company could look. But they don't have this uh, information actually, even though uh, there's actually a lot, a lot of power in having these core dumps available. And the reason for that is primarily because of the storage size. So if you imagine the entire process memory, which may be you know several megabytes large or hundreds of megabytes large, uh, you have to put that into a file. And an embedded device in particular, they just don't have that kind of space available. Um, some other things about core files, which uh, don't maybe they don't seem like a disadvantage right now, but I'll get a little bit more into it later, uh, is that when you have a core file sitting there, you actually do need debug tools to analyze this core file, because it's just an L file with a memory image in it which means I have to, basically, I have to analyze it offline. The device itself probably won't have debugging uh, tools available that it could debug itself, for example, or investigate what happened itself. And also, um, usually, Linux runs multi-processes, so there are um, embedded devices, there's probably lots of different applications that are running, perhaps with shared memory, or cooperating, or communicating with sockets. And it would maybe be nice to know if my application crashed, what was the state of all of these other applications that also communicate with it? And uh, of course, with the normal core dump facility, you don't have that information. You only have the information for the application that actually crashed. So the mini core dump project really would like to see core dumps being used in real small embedded device because there is a lot of value in those core dumps. So if we can manage to get the core dump file size down to something that's practical for embedded devices, then all of a sudden it becomes extremely attractive. Uh, so the, go the goals of the core dump, mini core dump project, of course we want to have some very small core dumps, but we also want to have customized core dumps. So we want to be able to, uh, yeah, that the developers can specify exactly what they want to have in these core dumps. And it would also be nice if we could support state stage snapshots. So like we could have, you know, we have 10 different applications that cooperate with each other, and when one of them crashes, then we have information from all 10 of those applications at the time of the crash. So those are the primary goals. And these are implemented in three main components that I'll talk about here. All of these are part of the Mini Core Dumper project, and we'll go into each of those in detail. So let's start off with the Mini Core Dumper. Uh, what this is, is a user space application, which extends the features of the uh, Linux Core Dump facility. Uh, it provides a configuration file uh, so that you can specify what kind of information you want in your core dump. Uh, it's also possible that you can have different configuration files per application. So maybe you have certain applications where you want this information stored, other applications you want other information stored. That's all uh, in separate configuration files uh, possible to, conf to configure. Uh, it also supports in compression memory because obviously we want to use compression that will help keep the size down but we don't want to dump the whole core file to the file system and then compress it because we don't have that initial space to dump it. So it also supports in-memory compression so that what actually does land on a physical medium 
is already a compressed core file. Uh, I try to keep the dependencies low because uh, that's also baggage that's important for uh, embedded systems. And what's also really important is there's no kernel patches required. Uh, obviously, if this was a really uh, attractive feature and we did require kernel support, uh, we could push it mainline. But the fact is, uh, we don't need uh, any kernel changes to use this. So, existing kernels and existing embedded systems can use this now. So one person may, you may ask, uh, how is it possible to be able to do all this from user space? And if we look at the main page of the core file, we see that uh, there's proxys kernel core pattern file. This is a, a virtual file where you can actually insert a pattern and say what you want your core files to look like, where you want, how you want it to be named. And if we go down a little bit further, we see that there's a special case for this file, that if, the file be, if this file specification begins with a pipe, then instead of specifying a file name, you're actually specifying an application that will be run. And then this application will receive the, the core, the original core file, what, what Linux would put on the, on, the, on the medium. Instead, it gives it over standard, standard output, standard input, uh, it pipes this core file. So it makes it possible to have a normal application, user space application, and through standard in, I'll get this core file. And again, this core file never actually touched the, any physical medium, it's actually being piped to me directly from memory. So as an example, if I want to use the mini-core dumper, then we can see here that I just have to put this string uh, starting with a pipe. The mini-core dumper, I can specify what, for, what kind of parameters uh, my application wants to have, and uh, I just throw that into the current core, core pattern file. And so if we go a little bit further down on the main page, we see, for example, uh, you can use these percent uh, values to specify the, the arguments for your application. So for example, the first one is the PID, which is uh, important. Uh, a little a word about the configuration files. So they're in the JSON format. And the main configuration file for the mini core dumper, it specifies the dump path. So it's the general path where the, dump, where the core files will be dumped to. And you also specify a set of matching rules uh, like uh, I said previously that you can have uh, different settings for different applications. And the settings for these applications are called recepts. Uh, that's, uh, that's a name. And uh, you can specify matching rules for these different recepts. So a recept file is also a JS1 format. And this is the file that actually contains the information about do you want to have stacks dumped, do you want to have uh, thread information dumped, uh, etc. We'll take a look in a second what it looks like. Uh, you can specify memory mappings and specific uh, exported symbols that you want dumped on compression objects. And this is all things that are done in the configuration file. So you actually don't have to touch the binary to set these things. Here's an example of the main configuration file. Here we specify with baster. This is the root directory where all the dumps will be sent to. And here we see some examples. Uh, there's Words exe and com, this is to match against the actual binding that's being run. Uh, run. Com matches against uh, rv null, uh, zero, so that's the, uh, you know, if this is a symbolic link or something like this, that's the, the name that will show up there. And uh, things that are optional. So for example, if I don't specify the reset file, that means in this, in this case that I just want the default mini core number options. Uh, this last one is, is matching against everything, so it would just be like a catch all if I wanted. And the way it works is it goes through, and the first match it has, that's the reset file it uses. And if it goes all the way through and there's no matches, then the no core dump will be uh, created at all. So you don't have to dump everything. You can just say, I'm only interested in my, couple, my applications, and for the other things, I'm not going to create a core dump. Here's an example of a recept. So here you see the stacks. You can choose if you want stacks dumped or not, if you only want the, the, the crashing stack dumped, or if you want all the stacks dumped, the size, etc. Uh, buffers, these are, these are exported symbols. So with NM, the NM utility, you can actually see what symbols are exported in, in these binaries and I'm, perhaps I also want to dump them. And you can also, for example, specify the compression option. So the compressor, you're actually specifying a binary that's called there. So in this, in this example, we're using gzip. You can also specify gzip2 or cat if you want no compression, etc. So how does it work? Uh, the first thing uh, happens is an application crashes. 
uh, the mini core dumper application is started, and this image is given to the this core file is pr provided to the mini core dumper and standard in. The first thing the mini core dumper does is reads the ELF headers uh, from this from the standard input uh, because that provides basically the the key information with how I can find everything. And the kernel's already generated all that for me, so I go ahead and grab that. It's usually it's typically only a part a couple kilobytes, so it's actually very small. After I have that information, actually, I don't use the rest of the core file anymore. Uh, everything else, once I have the ELF headers, um, I can use a couple of things in the proc file system, like maps. I get a nice listing of the memory maps and their names. Uh, from stat, I get a platform, uh, a platform independent uh, interface to get information about the stack pointers, the auxiliary vector, and uh, it's also available. And in procmem, that's actually a pointer into the memory of the process, so I can use procmem to actually bit particular pieces of information out. Um, of course, some of this information is, would also be available, most of this information would also be available in the core file that's given to me in standard in. Uh, the problem is it's not seekable. So the, the nice thing about using procm is I can jump back and forth and grab just the pieces I need. Uh, if I have to pull everything in standard in, and then I realize all I need is something that I already discarded, then but I'm in trouble. So that's why I only use standard in, uh, the Unicorn project only uses standard in for the health information. So after we have everything that we need, we know everything about this process, uh, now we can go ahead and grab the information that we're actually interested in. So we'll actually then begin writing our core file, and it's written as a sparse file. So a sparse file is a file that maybe is declared, let's say as an example, 500 megabyte file is declared, but I only write 27 bytes at this, at this position. And actually, that file is, should only take up 27 bytes, you know, actually a block, so it will only take up a few kilobytes on that file system, even though it's actually a, a 500 megabyte file. And the rest is automatically zeros. Uh, this is a sparse file. Because most of the, uh, the in a core dump, especially created by the mini core dumper, most of it will all be zeros. So we definitely want to use sparse files in that situation. Um, the mini-core dumper also appends some information, so I, I mentioned earlier a core file is in L format, and the mini-core dumper will actually append a custom a session node, which allows... Okay, so the mini-core dumper will actually append a custom session node information about what is done. Because uh, later we have a file that's mostly zeros, and then this is the question, what's really zero, and what is just, it was not dumped. And so this custom session note actually provides information about what was actually dumped. And uh, this in-memory compression that it does uh, uses the tar format optionally, but you basically always want to use it. The reason why I mention this is that tar has built-in support for sparse files. So I can create a tar file where I'm actually just specifying the 27 bytes in this 500 megabyte file. And I only have, to, so my tar file is actually quite small. And then that's what I give to gzip, for example. So if I, you know, if I did use tar and I just sent 500 megabytes to gzip, it takes a long time for that to compress. And you also notice if you use systems where you know, large applications crash, your system hangs for a while. It's because it's dumping and dumping and dumping. And if I can use the tar file, then I say, I only need these 27 bytes, send it to gzip, boom, the, the core file happens very, very fast. So let's look at some examples. Um, I took a relatively large application, so we have some, uh, some cooler numbers to look at. Uh, I just started Firefox, went to the Tracing Summit web page, and by sending the sig, sig file signal, I'm basically triggering a core dump. So, uh, you know, you can send different, there's different signals that you can send to processes, and there's default behaviors that occur with those signals. So by the uh, say V signal, uh, the default behavior is a crazy core dump. So in effect, uh, I'm simulating Firefox crashing. I did this three times, once using the normal default uh, Linux core dump facility settings without touching anything, tweaking anything. I did it once with Minicore without touching anything, just whatever Minicore default in installs. And then I did one where I, I had the defaults, only thing I changed was I said, please only dump the first thread. So I only want the crashing thread, not all of the threads. Which makes a big difference because Firefox starts like 49 threads. So. 
If we look at the numbers, we see that in all cases, they're a little bit different because there's three different runs. Uh, but the file size is approximately half a gigabyte uh, core file uh, for these. You'll see in the disk usage, this is, there's, when we use a sparse file, that we actually don't need ha uh, half a gigabyte of disk space. Even if you're using the default Linux core dump facility, uh, Linux also uses sparse files. So you'll see that even if you're using the default uh, disk uh, utility that's built into Linux, it's only 143 megabytes large. Many core dumper seven, and if I say I don't want the first, then it's 724 kilobytes, considerably smaller. So now we look at the last one, which is actually what you would want on your embedded device, is a compressed version of that. So in the, very, in the first situation, you just have 28 megabytes. And you have to keep in mind, the first one is actually quite expensive, because first you have to, uh, well, I mean, you could, you could do a custom. But if, you just use the, if you're just running a script that after a dump does, I, I compress it, then you have to realize that first it was 143 megabytes dump, and then I compressed it, and then I got rid of the 143 megabytes. Uh, definitely not practical in a bit. I have the mini core dumper, compress this down to a one megabyte, and if I say I just want the first thread, then we have one, 31 kilobytes. So this is a, a massive uh, savings. And uh, you have to keep in mind that what's produced is a valid core file. When you start GDB, it doesn't complain, it's happy, it finds all the symbols it needs, and it shows you the stack trace for your thread, and you have all of the information you need for the crashing thread that you would normally uh, require to debug. And so uh, even if I say, OK, I only want the, the, the crashing thread, and you just you know, set this, which is very easy to set in the configuration file, that's way, way, way better than if you had nothing. So a, uh, the device is sent back because it's got a problem. And if I can look, OK, I've got this. Yours will definitely will be 31 kilobytes for big because uh, Firefox is big. And if you have Hello World or something, then it's like three, three kilobytes. So, you know, uh, you can imagine that a uh, normal application or an embedded application probably will be much smaller anyway. But you have this very small uh, uh, core, uh, uh, compressed core, core image that you can then just look at GB and then uh, see at least where it went. <coughs> and you can at least inspect uh, information about what's on the stack. <coughs> so really there's uh, uh, the embedded uh, Developers or embedded system developers are running on it, would be running on resources <coughs> why they wouldn't want to use Cordos. I mentioned these L section of that added, so let me just show this briefly. Um, you can, with the ELF utilities, you can look at the different sections that are added. Here you see the, the, the note that's added, the section, section note, and uh, the data. So in, in the case of this, uh, this is with all the threads of uh, Firefox, so it adds an extra four kilobytes to the, the core file under the process. Uh, by the way, uh, there was when I it, when this was implemented, uh, there was a bug uh, discovered in the Elf, and so actually you need at least version uh, 167, which is the it's already been tagged. It should be really soon, uh, but it's something you should be aware of. Uh, the the mini core devil will log the information that you don't have at least this version, so it could not uh, modify the, the section. Of And then, of course, if we have a custom section note, then some, somebody has to interpret this custom section note. And uh, by default, if I just name it, take the GB, uh, and this is an example, this is, I just looked at a symbol that's there that uh, Firefox exports, and this underscore e data, I don't know what it is, but it's exported. If I look at it with a normal GDB, I see a value of zero. And that's because it's a, it was a sparse file, and so we see a zero in there. Uh, now the question is, is it a zero because it really is zero? Because this is a null pointer, or is it zero because it wasn't done? Um, the Neutronics implemented a, a fork. It's actually a quite small patch uh, for GDB. That just also, rather than directly just dumping the memory, it first checks a list to see if this memory is actually available. And in this case, if we, we now look with this modified GDB, we see that it's unavailable when we try to print that data. And that's much more useful. Huh? At least we know, okay, it's not available. Okay, look at that. I mentioned as a few dependencies. So what do I mean by a few dependencies? Uh, this is significant list, but you have to realize that uh, just because of all of the debugging and thread debugging and elf parsing that happens, 
there are some libraries that require the libjson is necessary because the configuration files are in JSON. Other than that, you don't see any uh, large libraries like uh, dbus, systemd, so things like this you don't see. So it should be relatively attractive. So just a summary of the mini core number uh, component. Uh, you know, we have, there's low storage overhead because we don't have too many dependencies. There's absolutely no runtime overhead whatsoever. We just simply, it's available on the system. We add this, we notify Linux that if there is a core dump, it should use my binary. But otherwise, during runtime, there's no overhead at all. The configuration is quite simple. You can use out-of-the-box recepts, actually. And even if you say, I just want the first thread, uh, you just have to change one Boolean. And you have really a very powerful uh, mechanism add, added to the system. And uh, you just have very uh, useful crash information because you definitely have uh, for the crashing thread the stack trace, which is probably, for me as a developer, that's the most valuable information that you can have. Actually. And these are very, very small dumps. So even if people, uh, even if uh, companies say, yeah, we don't have any names that we want read writable, we don't have any nor we want read writable, we don't have any, anything, then, you know. Do they have eight kilobytes of EEPROM available somewhere? You know, is there something that I can just, you know, e quadrat e, e squared c just to dump the data somewhere? Because if even if you have eight kilobytes somewhere where I can put this, that's very very valuable for the developers when these devices uh, get sent back to the company because they're crashing. But there's more. So that was the mini core dumper itself. Now we're going to talk a little bit about lib mini core dumper. This is a separate component, so you don't have to use this. The mini core dumper on itself that we already talked about is a to totally standalone. This is a further component that's available in the mini core dumper project. So it's called lib mini core dumper. It's a user space library, and it provides an API for applications to specify exact data that they want dumped. So I can actually say I want these five bytes from this string dumped, and this and I can actually specify exact data that I want dumped. I can specify that I want the data dumped in the core or done external to the core. In a minute, I'll show why that's useful. And I can also choose to have the data text formatted, in a, like in a printf string that I could create myself with maybe plain English text that actually explains the value of this variable at is this when I crash. You know? And that information will be dumped. And uh, you also have the, uh, the uh, possibility of unregistering data. So you know maybe you have data that's you're, you've allocated, uh, you want it to be done to the crashes, but later you deallocate that, and then you can unregister it. You should unregister it before you deallocate it, but um, you have the option to uh, so dynamically configure what is going to be done. And it also needs to have a few dependencies because your your application will live again. Yeah, so this is particularly interesting because we have, of course, now. We can minimize our core in even more because perhaps you, your application, if we're only using the configuration files and you have information that you want that's dynamically allocated, so it's sitting on the heap, and you want to have that information, if you're only using the configuration files from the mini core dumper, then you have to say, give me the heap. And that's a lot. And perhaps your application only needs 20 bytes here, 50 bytes there, and you don't want to dump the whole heap, you just want to dump these particular bytes. So we can make our core dump even smaller. Uh, if we can make use of this uh, library. And of course, we can also dump uh, private data so it's internal, uh, no exported symbols, and things like this. And the nice thing about the uh, reason why external dump files are, inter are interesting is because it gives the application a chance maybe to analyze what happens, so the embedded device itself. You know, I mentioned earlier that a core file requires debugging utilities to, to parse and to read. But if I'm dumping a text file, then at least I maybe have something I can throw in a log file or in a message, something that I can show the user or, or some, something more useful that an embedded system, which really doesn't have a lot available, can do something. It can try to react a little bit on the situation. So that's why external files are particularly useful. The way it works is that the mini core dump exports two <coughs> symbols. One is the version. This is so that I know uh, what version of uh, the mini core dump I'm working with. And then uh, there's a symbol that actually is the head of a linked list that pr provides all the dump information, all of the individually registered dumps for that application. So when an application crashes, mini core dump, the first thing it does, checks if these symbols are available. And if they are, okay, I know I've got a lib mini core dump application where I can uh, 
dump this uh, additional information into the core file. And so we see here at the bottom that you can see that the only two uh, data dynamic objects that are exported in the living model. The API is actually quite simple. There's really only three functions. Um, so we have a function for registering binary data. We have a function for registering text data. This is this printf formatted uh, hello you. Yeah. And uh, we have a function for registering data. Uh, for text, we have two functions because some people uh, you might be in a situation in your application where you already have a, a variable argument list uh, type, and you need to make use of that. So there's, there's two variants of the text registration. In all three uh, of these registration functions, you see that the first three parameters are the same. Uh, the first argument is the, the name of the external file. In the case of binary registration, if this is null, it means you want it in the core file, not external. Uh, it also supports scoping, so you can actually register lots of different things. This is uh, maybe in different situations. You can think of it like debug levels in the kernel, where you have things you would like to dump if, in the configuration file, this debug level is speci specified. So you know the the dumping scope is specified in the configuration file. Now, so you create a reset, and you say, in this case, I want to have a dumping scope of 100, and then everything uh, with 100 or less will be dumped. And the other things will be done. So you have a so a debugging mechanism that you can dynamically add into there. Uh, the third argument is just an opaque uh, object type. Uh, the only reason that exists is so that when you do unregister, you can give them a handle and say, this is what I want unregistered. So the registration function gave you that. Otherwise, by binary, it's what you would expect. You have a pointer and size. Uh, there's some flags in there, we won't go into that. And for text registration, uh, you have so printf, actually scanf format. Uh, so you provide things in the way of uh, the way that you do a scanf. So I don't provide uh, my integer, I provide a pointer to my integer, even though I specify a percent d, for example. So we can look at a sample program really quick. Uh, here I have a, a string that I allocate on the heap. I have an integer that I allocate on the heap, uh, set to value 42. Uh, the string we're going to go ahead and put into the allow it to be dumped into the core file. The integer will be dumped externally in a file called uh, i.bin, and I'm also going to specify a text output uh, called output text, and the output looks like this. So it's going to when we look at this file, we're going to see s equals quote. It's going to look uh, nice, and then my application kills itself. Uh, so x is null. And this will should crash. And indeed, when I run it, it crashes. Um, the, all of the crash, all of the dumps are only readable by root. So since I don't want to be root right now, um, I'm going to modify the permissions. So this would be the, the path to the, the root of all of the dumps. And you'll see that a new directory was created. This is the rv null, uh, rv0, and dates, timestamps, PIDs, and so on. So this is actually a directory that's created. So let's go in that directory and look at what we see. And we'll see here's the i.bin file, the out.txt file, here's the compressed core file, and we also see an additional file that I haven't talked about called system map. System map is just a file that provides information where these binary dumps came from. So where they came from, where were they in memory, and where would they be if they were in the core file. So this is the information provided there. Let's check out our out.txt to see what's in it. And indeed, we see. Uh, the printf string, the, yeah, the printf string that we uh, wanted to have. And so we see that at the time of the crash, uh, s was my string, and uh, the, the resolving of uh, the integer pointer was 42, which is what we'd expect. And this information was extracted at the moment of the crash, and not at the moment of registration. You know? So if I had changed the, the value of i, uh, the data that i is pointing to, before i crashed, then you would see the changed value there. So let's go ahead and look at it with our core dump, the GDB. Uh, so I decompress the core file. And uh, when we look at it, we see everything is fine. GDB is happy with this core file. Uh, we can look at that's, uh, S, which is uh, what S is pointing to actually looking at. So we're looking at my string. Uh, I is a pointer, so we can actually look at the pointer value. But if I try to print what I is pointing to, this is not available. It's because we dumped it externally. It's not in the core file. And because we're using this modified version of GDB, we see that it's not available. Otherwise, we would see zero, which is, by measures, probably not good because it's probable that the value will 
Um, so I mentioned earlier that you have the system.map file that contains all the information. The mini core dump, dumper project provides a tool called core inject, and you actually have the possibility to re-inject this binary data into the core file. So this is an example showing that. I wrote core inject, I give them the core file, the system map, and the, the externally dumped binary files it tells me that it was injected. And now when I look at OGDB, now I can also print what I is pointing to. It's suddenly available. Dependencies, let's see. Don't think it much more than that. So summary about the Linux core dumper component. Uh, here also has a low storage overhead, so we don't have a lot of additional cost uh, in adding this to your existing uh, applications. There's also no runtime overhead, so having it there running, there's no, it doesn't create any threads that do anything in the background, or it, you know, it doesn't cause any overhead in that area. The API is really quite simple. There isn't much to do other than to register and deregister. And now you're able to specify exact data that you want to have in your core dumps. And of course this, yeah? So how expensive are the registration? Yeah, so the registration looks, obviously there is overhead in that. So, uh, so if you have a very dynamic heap, this might be made. Uh, so we'll see in a minute what happens when, when uh, the registration occurs. Uh, actually, we're not. Uh, so the registration itself, there is a, for example, a malloc that, that occurs and onto this linked list. So these are things that should be, that have to be taken account. So yeah, I apologize, no runtime over is probably uh, incorrect. If you're doing a lot of dynamic registering and unregistering, then obviously there is runtime overhead. But if you are registering things and in the lifetime of your application, actually you don't need to do any further registrations, there is no additional runtime overhead. That's, that's what I meant actually by the sense. But I will correct in the slides. Um, yeah. So if you are doing things like you want to have a linked list dump that you are dynamically allocated, as was uh, mentioned, you know, then every time I allocate a new node, I'm registering it, and I'm deallocating nodes, I'm deregistering it. Uh, at, that support is available. So there is one more component, and that is the live dumps. And what live dumps are is that you can dump the information that applications have registered while they're running and without them having to crash. You know, and so this, we're going towards this idea, it would be nice if we could get information from lots of other applications at the same time. So there's one application and it crashed, and I have eight other applications that would like to know what their, uh, what their states were. And so this provides that functionality. Uh, these dumps from the non-crashing applications, it can be, it can be triggered when, I, when an application crashes, or it can be triggered manually at any time. And this also brings relatively few dependencies. So this is particularly interesting because you can get stage snapshots. And I mentioned here pseudo stage snapshots. Uh, I will talk about that in a minute why. So the way that this works is that uh, there's a daemon that, that runs, the mini core dumper regd, it's registration daemon. And it creates a local domain socket that is available. And this socket is set up so that it receives credentials. So this means any application, so this, can, this only works locally, you can't, uh, doesn't, doesn't public, isn't available outside of the machine. Uh, and any application that sends datagrams to the socket automatically uh, sends all of its credentials with it. So this means that the registration daemon is able to know which PID sent me this, this packet. And so that's what's actually really important, especially if, for example, perhaps this application is running in a container in a different namespace, uh, a different PID namespace, that, that means the PID that this application thinks it has is not the PID that the it's called a root system thinks it, that knows it has. And so uh, when the credentials are sent, the kernel automatically translates that information, so the mini core dumper registration daemon actually knows the real PID on the system for this application. And this, P, P, this list of PIDs are then stored in shared memory uh, that will be made available to the mini core dumper when it crashes. And there we can see, actually there's two uh, sockets that are created uh, or that's just so that there's graceful shutdown. Okay, but you can actually see that the, the sockets are there if you need to debug it to the buttons for So that was the component of the registration daemon. The lib mini core number, it needs to uh, notify the registration daemon that I am one of the PIDs that uh, you also need to dump. So 
in your application, the first when you do the very first time that you register a binary register a binary dump or a text uh, dump, the first time that you register, it also will send a datagram to the registration data and say, "I've got data that I've registered, so if a crash occurs, you need to dump my stuff as well." And if you unregister everything that you've uh, your application unregisters everything that it had registered, and of course upon the very last unregistration, then we send also send a datagram to say. You don't need to dump me, I have more information. It wouldn't hurt if the, the mini core dumper tried anyway, you would, you would see that there's nothing there, but for efficiency reasons, obviously, it's nicer if you can unregister those. So, then the last component in this live dumping uh, scenario is the mini core dumper itself. Uh, so, when an application crashes, the first thing the mini core dumper does is it reads the PID list that's stored in shared memory, so it knows which applications have information. To be, uh, that should be dumped as well. Uh, it uses uh, ptrace calls, ptrace sees, and ptrace interrupt to immediately halt all of the applications, all of the threads uh, that have registered data. The reason why we do this is not because it technically is necessary to get the data, but because we want to try to get this snapshot. Uh, so the first thing we do is we freeze everybody to try to get everybody hopefully in the same state. And then we can go through and we can dump all of their data unfreeze them, and the last thing we do is we dump our crash application because it's not going to be a crash. Dependencies, uh, obviously all of these dependencies are subsets of the mini core dumper itself, so if you, if you have the mini core dumper binary on the, on the machine, then that's all of the dependencies you're going to need anyway. So I talked about pseudo-stage snapshots because I'm sure you can obviously uh, imagine that when a crash happens, the kernel needs to fire up the mini core dumper application the mini core dumper application parses its configuration files, identifies the correct recept that's uh, uh, appropriate for this uh, crash, and then it can decide, because in this recept it says if you're even interested in, in live dumps, then it can say, ah, you do want live dumps, and now it can start to freeze everybody. So this is actually time that occurs, everybody else is still happily running before you decide if you even want to do live dumps. And then of course there's the latency of you actually uh, freezing each one at a time, going through all of the threads, freezing all of the threads, and this is just a latency that exists. So this is why I call it a pseudo-stage snapshot, because there is latency that exists. And it's really hard, I wanted to do some numbers, but it's, it's so system-dependent, load-dependent, application-dependent, the number of cores you have running dependent, I, you can't really provide real numbers. But at least I can show you how bad it is. So. Uh, you can imagine that uh, you should be able to expect that there are latencies from 2 to 30 milliseconds before the very first, uh, very first frozen dumps, <coughs> the very first frozen process occur, and all the additionals could be anywhere from 30 microseconds to 4 milliseconds, depending on your system and situation. So these are significant latencies, especially if we're talking about uh, you know, systems that need to react quickly. Uh, 2 milliseconds is a lot, 30 seconds is a lot. So in summary of the live dumps, uh, we have a low storage overhead. This doesn't have any additional dependencies that we don't already have from the mini core dumper. Uh, we're now able to dump from multiple applications, but you need to be aware there are latencies there. So it's not a true snapshot in this crash. In order to achieve that, we would need to do uh, get some, do some kernel uh, tweaking. And obviously, we could optimize the mini core dumper so that uh, it's more prepared, that when a dump happens, it can respond more quickly. Uh, but I, yeah, it's not optimized at that level yet. And uh, there is no runtime overhead, but you do need to be aware, and this is critical, is that it uses ptrace sees and interrupt uh, on the applications that are registered to get this information. So if these are actually real-time applications, you need to be aware that they could possibly, when one of them dumps, they could possibly be frozen for, for 40, 50, even 60 milliseconds. Um, Actually, since there is no technical reason for the dump, I'm considering adding an option where you can say I don't want to use computer C, so I just want to grab it. If it's not saying, it's not saying. Uh, yeah, grabbing life stack is tricky. It's true, yeah, it might be, it could, yeah, life stack would be, yeah, but you're not, uh, I'm not talking about the stack. So the only thing you grab is the registered information. Oh, okay. So, so we're, not, we're not creating core dumps of everybody else, we're only grabbing their, the application specific. Uh, because the, the grabbing core dumps would be significantly more, more overhead. So we're only grabbing information in the which should be it should be allowed to do that at all, uh, whether it's live or uh, yeah, it could be tricky in a live system too. Uh, but 
I do in the demand page there are hint, uh, notices about you have to be careful anyway about live registration because you never know when you're going to be frozen. So the status of the project, uh, I'm about to release the uh, next major release, which is 2.0. That's the one that actually I showed here. And uh, I, in order to remember, the only reason I mention that is because if you go to the website and look at the online man pages, you'll see they're slightly different. See, there's actually slightly more dependence for talking to DBUS and iNotify. All of that is not there anymore. Uh, the 2.0 should be done quickly. Uh, I'm just I'm working on the Debian packages and open embedded Yoko. Uh, later, and I would really like to get those all coordinated at the same time so that uh, the 2.0 is, is uh, yeah, developers always want their point release to work with one of them. Okay, questions, comments? Do I have time for questions, comments? Yep. Okay. Uh, I find this incredibly interesting, and I was wondering are there any of the techniques that could be brought into the regular port hubs? I mean, like the sparse virus files, compression on the fly. Uh, so that you don't write the file and press it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's an idea if you want to try to bring this mainline, but I mean, really, mainline, I mean, the hooks are there for user space to do it. And so, uh, I mean, if you really can come with a good argument that it's important in the current because of latency issues, sort of particularly with the snapshots, the live dumps, that would really be helpful if, if you know, if the kernel could immediately, uh, get, you know, pull everybody at that moment where we know the crash that would be a much better snapshot. Um, but other than that, I, I would imagine upstream would say, you can do it easily. So do it easily. I also have no problem. It works great. You know, it's not, uh, Is there any uh, differences between uh, if we are using that versus the normal uh, port up? I mean, will they miss some information? Um, I mean, obviously, there's some information that you're not getting <coughs> because you're choosing not to dump it. Uh, so that's the information you're missing. But the, the, all the critical information, and actually the, the reset files have lots of configuration. If you want to jump, uh, dump uh, the robust new text list, and there's all kinds of really technical things that you can say I want to dump or not dump, the default values are to dump all of these things because GDB would like to see them. And so uh, the default values there are actually uh, to satisfy GDB. So if you use the default values and dump those, all these really technical things as well, because they're not that big, the GDP will be totally happy. So, I mean, it's just a more efficient way to have this program, even for a normal way. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's really no reason to, to, to well, I mean, it just depends what you need. You know, the, the, the default won't dump uh, the heap. Yeah, so if you, you know, a lot of application developers would expect there to be a heap there that they can debug. So, um, just turning it automatically on default on all systems on the planet probably is a good idea because we're leaving out a lot of possibilities for But I think this is uh, one of the challenges of the real problem to find out what needs to be. Uh, I mean, we are interested also in in, in, in real world, so we have we have experience with that. Uh, if I only want to get a, a stack back trace of maybe of the question thread or maybe of some other threads, then I only want to have this information. It's, it's not so easy to get uh, a memory uh, image or picked out those sections which contain uh, the necessary section which uh, GDB needs uh, finally for resolving the stack. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that a good problem because some, in some other systems you have uh, numbers you can just specify uh, uh, with, a, with an option just to, to dump all the stack and then you get a stack factory so right away. But uh, the limits, uh, you have, uh, on, on the one hand you have uh, lib unwind which is not working properly or you can use the GDB libraries uh, to, to unwind the stack and, and, and both of them, they need some information which is distributed all over the image and it's hard really to use that. Yes, that's correct. Is there a solution from your side? Yeah, get this that is actually why the units on the are so great because it grabs all of this information. So I've already gone through, and not just me, there's so four or five developers before me, uh, that have gone through and did the hard work of figuring out what does GDB actually want, where is all this information available, the mini code would grab exactly that information. So uh, that's why we saw, for example, that when I dumped one thread of, of Firefox, it was 740 kilobytes of real data. That, that wasn't just the stack. You know, there was lots of information there to satisfy GDB as well. And so that's what the mini code already does for you. you know, it pulls all of these pieces that GDB needs. Because my goal was you start GDB and it's happy. But you don't even realize you have a, a mini code dump core file. 
Yeah, we, we have experience that with some C application it works uh, pretty well. It works fine, but if you're using maybe complex C++ with templates and stuff and all that, <coughs> then you suddenly find that, that the stack uh, traces you get, they are somehow corrupted or the ending up not in the real stack. But, uh, I mean, if you have examples, uh, I would love it if you posted it to the... So Firefox is a pretty complicated application, and that strike trace is beautiful, and I just said it didn't make a first try. So I guess exception uh, handling in C++ or things like that, perhaps there are other things in that. Yeah, so examples. Um, if I have examples, then I can start building what's missing. Because it is really important that GB can identify it from the get-go. Yeah, it would be nice uh, eventually, when, especially when this is an Ubuntu and Debian, have uh, like a few examples there in the project as well. You can yeah. store it in there and uh, it would be quite nice. And also uh, to have it uh, with some server type of uh, application also, not just Firefox, because that's usually where this is really useful. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, so nice. But I have to say that it is difficult because it really is application specific. Yes, you yes. Everyone, the only the individual developers know what they actually want to have. So it's really hard to do, you can do examples, but the default configurations are always. And maybe we, we can have one where, where they, they have also, uh, I, I think there's a way to get further information, like you can also add some uh, text logs, or maybe you can add some birth data, or LTT entry traces, and so it, as you say, it's configurable, so you can, I guess, get data from a few other places as well, and, and put that in, the, in, in that directory. Or... Yeah, that might be interesting, um, to, maybe to add a callback to this, to this live dump situation, so that a custom application could be run. Yeah, first, uh, short question is the chance of getting the GDP patch up uh, I, so <laughs> yeah, I see no reason why not. It's really a small patch. GDP actually already provides the entire infrastructure for doing that. All I had to do was basically redshirt, and I wasn't the one who actually did most of the work. Uh, uh, it was, was a very small patch, so. I've never been uh, communicated with the GDD guys, and it wasn't the pri my priority at the time, so I don't know how much work was involved in that. Okay, and um, my biggest fear, of course, would be that I know you write about free code, but still, if the mean core number crashes, is there any way you know, to, to uh, have a fallback that still dumps the core dump like it used to be? No. No. So no, it's if it crashes, I'm screwed. <laughs> if it crashes, you're in trouble, yeah. And this, the, the kernel has a uh, when you have specified that I want the kernel to run this application, then the kernel really does trust the application. When the kernel, when that application crashes, which is in my development situation has happened, then the kernel sh protects itself, and basically automatically puts the core file size of zero, and now it doesn't even drop a core to the mini core number. So you have no core at all. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask if there's anything specific to a particular CPU architecture or if your solution is completely independent. As far as I wanted to put a list of support architectures, but I'm afraid to. But uh, uh, there really is nothing that specific. So if the like, stack information can be a little bit critical. That's why I use uh, the, the prop file system to, to parse that information. And not stack information, the stack pointer information, for example, to take particular registers. That's extremely platform dependent. So I try to use, in those situations, I try to use the prop file system because the Linux provides a nice interface to show, for example, register information. Uh, parsing of L files, this is all platform. So I know the PowerPC 3264 ARM, so we have big ending, we have little ending, we have 64-bit, 32-bit, I know that those work. Um, I've never tried MIPS, I've never tried Spark. So but, but basically, you prefer to rely on, on GPD? No, I don't rely on GPD at all. So I, I rely on the yeah. ELF that does all of the ELF parsing, and then I rely on the PROC file system to provide information, for example, about memory map names and things like this. Yeah, but, but if, if, if you want to um, analyze the core down files, then you rely on GPD. I am not for taking the core downs itself. But, um, I expect people would use GPD, but you know, I, it's not a custom core file. So really, any any application that can deal with core files should be happy with the mini core down. Yeah, there actually is a, an option where you can turn on 
the proc information is, is given, and then there is so uh, yeah, a handful, which is like eight or nine. And then one of them is the file descriptors, all the link list, all the links, soft links are there, so you can actually see uh, the file descriptors that were open and where they were going. Uh, that is there. But there may be information that you want that's not there, but then just write on the mailing list. So. Uh, so for the lit mini core dumper, have you thought about integrating with memory allocators uh, for the dynamic registration and unregistration of, uh, of items? So, so an application could specify that it wants to allocate through a specific API call its memory, and it would automatically track that memory within the lit mini core dumper, and when, when it's free, it would be unregistered. I mean, that's possible, but if you're going to do that, you might as well just dump the whole heap, I think. But the application could choose to uh, to use that for part of its memory. That's critical, and not use it for large parts. Sure, is, that's sure interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's something that a developer could do themselves. Okay, so, how much should I do for them? Second guessing what people have, want to have. So, but it's definitely a possibility. Also, I suppose your your registration is global. Yeah, the the global. So you only have one list of yes. registered. Yeah, you can first so you can go to the uh, dynamic situation you're contending on a log. If there's lots of logging and uh, if there's lots of dynamic use, yeah, then you're definitely a lot of uh, yeah, it's in shared memory, so it's even more expensive than the yeah. other. Okay. One last question. If not, uh, thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.